what a great song. And the scriptures are always wonderful to read and, and to listen to. Our scripture today is uh, lifted from Luke chapter 7, beginning with verse 36. Wonderful story in the Word of God. Let's read it together. If you have your Bibles or if you prefer to read right up here on the screen, it'll be projected for you. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, This man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, Say it, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and another 50. When they were unable to repay, he generously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have judged correctly. I like that, don't you? Simon, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much. But he who forgiveth little, loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. May the Lord today add his blessings to the reading of his word. What lessons did you learn from that? I would ask you the question, how much do you owe? Or are you in debt to anyone? Surely none among us would reply openly to such a personal question. And I also doubt that few would even share such personal information privately. We would surely decide that our debt is our own business. Are you may be in the enviable position to reply, well, I don't know anybody anything. My mortgage is marked paid in full. My car is mine. I don't have any credit card debt. No one has a lien on my property. I am debt free. Well, I guess it's a good thing to be free of debt, isn't it? As a matter of fact, the Holy Scripture is commended as far as our financial condition is concerned. And at the same time, the Scriptures tells it like it is concerning death. We embrace it as a necessary component of our modern life, but especially if you're beginning your adult life. 
Likely you have a mortgage, likely you own a car, likely you have credit card debt. As a matter of fact, we are told since 2007, when consumer debt started to really go down, when the Great Recession hit with all of its force and, and with all of its ferocity, but, but now we learn that consumer debt is starting to go up again. We're feeling a little better about ourselves, and we're feeling a little more confident in our jobs, and we're feeling like we have a little more money to spend, and housing, we are told the value of our homes are starting to inch up a little more, and that gives us a little more equity. So people are feeling a little better about debt. And then, of course, there's another component of this, and that's anyone graduating from college. I wondered how much is the average student debt for someone graduating from college? Now for those of you who graduated in the 60s or 70s or 80s, this may be a shock to you. But I learned and I went online to money.com this week to try to find out what that number was and I was startled to learn that the average person graduating from college this year will be in debt $32,500 when they get their diploma. Now that's just the debt from college. That's just the debt from your higher education experience. And if you go into post-grad work, maybe into your master's or doctorate, that number just inflates no telling how far, depending on the profession you're pursuing. And then you add to that a mortgage. Then you add to that your uh, car that you're trying to to pay on and your credit card debt that you're trying to pay and the cable bill or the or the a dish TV bill and your cell phone bill and all these other bills no wonder we have a generation that is haggard and tired and worried and concerned of course there's also taxes and for all those of us who are older, health care. By the way, Brother Dwayne finally reached the mark. 65 years old. On Medicare now. We all celebrated. He didn't. Gloria did. How quickly it happens. But if you're at the age that we are now, you know that you have to buy insurance and that can be very expensive. And there for several years there were people in the age group of those trying to balance how much money do I have that I can have more at the end of the month, maybe or a little more at the end of the month than I started with, but then comes along the medicines they have to buy. And there are people literally deciding, folks in our county, will I buy medicine this month or will I buy food this month? Will I pay my propane bill this month or will I pay my electric bill this month? And they have to decide and there's trade-offs. When it comes to debt, the Bible talks about it in Proverbs chapter 2, 22, verse 7. And it says something that should startle us into some type of reality. It says, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. Remember that scripture. Because it is absolutely true, isn't it? I believe the Bible accurately, accurately describes the condition of a, of a debtor. And I think any of you would agree with me that no one should live as a slave, at least not very long. But I want you to know something. You might say, I'm out of debt, but you're not. There is a debt that we can never pay. Now, I'm not talking about your, your taxes. That's something we will never pay off. No, I'm talking about a debt that was incurred whenever we come to the age of accountability and we sinned against our God. That is a debt we cannot pay. The woman in our story knew that full well. 
You see, in our scripture lesson for today, this woman, this woman that we read about, as you noticed, is unnamed. Some have claimed that she was the very same woman that Matthew wrote about who anointed Jesus. But there's too many differences. No, I believe this story stands alone and for good reason. You see, the Bible tells us here in Luke that Jesus was invited into a home of a notable Pharisee named Simon. You know what surprised me about this story? Really, our Lord's reaction to this woman wasn't a surprise to me. He has a pretty long history of loving and forgiving sinners. What really surprised me was that he would go into the home of a Pharisee. That he would go into the home of a Pharisee. As I have noted over the last several weeks, they were not best of, of friends. They were not buddies. But here we find that Jesus apparently is willing to go into anyone's life that invites him in. Even a stinking Pharisee. Wow. This Pharisee was highly respected by the people in his, com his community. So to be invited into his home, you would have thought would have been a great honor. Why he invited Jesus into his home is a matter of speculation, but I would imagine it's because the fame of Jesus as a healer had reached his ears and he was interested in who this young rabbi was from Galilee. A notable Christian author and leader was asked a question recently. His name is Philip Jenkins. He's a great historian and, and I have read some of his work. Philip Jenkins was asked a question uh, and he, uh, by the way, he's one of the greatest, I would think, one of the greatest modern church historians that there is today. And he was asked the question, what is the difference between the church then and the church now? And he said, you don't have to think about then and now. Think about third world, or for example, Africa, and think about European American. And he said the difference is healing. One word, healing. And I'm not just talking about the physical healing that was associated with the charismatic movement. He said, I'm talking about the whole person being healed. He said, for example, if you go into Uganda today and you have a, a worship service, it is not uncommon at the beginning of the service for the, the leader to say, who has been healed this week? And it wouldn't be uncommon at all for two or three people to stand up and say, I have this problem in my back or this problem in my mind or this problem in my spirit and I prayed and God healed me. Dear friends, we need more healing today. There are too many broken people that need to find healing in their lives not just from the medications they take or from the counsel they receive from maybe someone with a great education and how the mind works. But they need to know Jesus Christ and find healing in Him, and they need to find that through His church. They need to see examples of people who have been healed. They need to see people sitting in the pew who have been healed. Jesus was a healer. As a matter of fact, not just a healer, but if you look at the story that preceded this one, not only had Jesus restored sight to the blind and healed lepers, but Jesus had actually brought life to a young man that was dead. See, Simon was rich by the standards of his day, yet Jesus came into his home, Simon may have been among those who developed awesome respect for Jesus after he heard that he had raised a widow's son. 
The Bible says, After that great fear swept over the crowd, and they praised God, saying, A mighty prophet has risen among us. We have seen the hand of God at work today. And his fame, the Bible said, spread across the borders because this woman had received her son back to life. Wonder how much she owed him. I wonder how much this woman who was a widow who received her son back to life, I wonder how much she owed Jesus for his services. Yet we find that the Lord charged no fee. He just gave her back her son, a son that was lost to death. But now to our story. As Jesus was enjoying his meal, reclining at the table, this woman learned that he was there and eventually found her way into the room. And I want you to know something. This woman was a woman deep in debt. And it was a debt that she could never pay. Luke called her a sinner. And I noticed in, in my translation of the scriptures she is also called a sinner but there is a little one beside the word sinner because that word is a special word not only was she a sinner she was a person that, according to the to the meaning of the word that was literally devoted to sin she was sold out to rebellion against God this describes a woman of the streets, the villain of Proverbs. Perhaps her reputation had been well earned. This woman was laden with sin. You see, in the Old Testament, sin was thought of as a burden to be carried. I'd never thought about that before, but recently it was brought to my attention. In Leviticus chapter 4, verse 24, uh, the law declared that uh, for example, if a leader of a community or a religious leader was to do something and sin against God unintentionally, it was his responsibility at great price to buy this goat and to lay his hand on the head of the male goat and to slay it in the place where they slay the burnt offering before the Lord. It, it is a sin offering and this was done by this leader who unintentionally sinned and his sin was revealed to him. And by doing this, the weight of his sin was transferred to that goat. Once a year, it was transferred to a goat that was to be released into the wilderness after the high priest had laid his hand on it. And that would symbolize the burden of all the sins of the people being transferred on something that was released and let go. But in the New Testament, when the New Testament refers to sin, typically it's not so much a burden as a debt to be paid. A terrible debt. So this woman might be easily compared to the man in a parable that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 18 verse 23. It seems that a king decided to call into account some of his stewards or some of his slaves and one of them owed him 10,000 talents. That is an unbelievable debt, an unthinkable debt. Of course the steward was unable to pay the debt so the king ordered that he and his entire family would be sold into slavery. This man was bankrupt. He was poverty stricken. He was so deeply so he was so deeply immersed into debt that he could never pay it. He was morally, spiritually bankrupt, hopelessly bankrupt. Just like this woman must have felt as she approached Jesus that day. See this lady was a prostitute. And according to the law that they lived under, under that time, the money she earned from prostitution was tainted. So she couldn't take the money and go and buy a sacrifice that would atone for her sins. She was, she was hopeless. She was helpless. There was nothing she could do. And she must have felt it every day of her life. 
until one day she saw Jesus. And then for the first time in a very long time, she believed that she had value in God's eyes. She wasn't just a thing to be bought and sold. She was a person made in the image of God, an image that had been scarred and disfigured by sin. She learned that Jesus was in town somehow and at the home of Simon the Pharisee. The word Pharisee literally means separated one. Separated from what? Well, they believed they were separated from sinners. Remember in the parable Jesus gave about the old tax collector that stood with his hand beating on his chest saying, God forgive me, a sinner. The Pharisee was in the temple praying and very deliberately that story has them separated. If the Pharisees even rushed up against a sinner in the street, he would rush home and wash his clothes because he had been painted by it. Remember, Jesus went into his home So she must have wondered somewhere in her heart. She must have had some fear somewhere in her soul. What would happen to me if I crashed this dinner? Well, eventually it seemed that none of that mattered very much to her. She was so overcome with love that she hurried home and uncovered her treasure in an alabaster box. She rushed back to Simon's home and made her way to Jesus. Then she did the unthinkable. She opened her jar and poured it out on the feet of Jesus. This was something that was very expensive. What she did was unusually extravagant. When was the last time you loved Jesus extravagantly? When was the last time you did something that didn't make sense because you loved Jesus? When was the last time you gave something of yourself that people might say, I wonder if there's something wrong with him or her for, for the way she's behaving and what she's doing. When was the last time you did anything extravagant? This woman did something extravagant. The Bible says her tears mingled with the expensive per perfume and then she did something that no proper woman would do. She let down her hair in public. By the way, if you recall, that's a divorceable offense in the days of Jesus. And she wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. Her love and her gratitude freed her from all restraints. She was overcome with love and she wanted to worship Him. And Simon was appalled by it all. It even made him question whether or not Jesus was really the real deal. He began to think in his heart, well, if Jesus was really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this was. And of course, Jesus knew his heart. Simon, I have something to say to you. I don't know about you, but I think a cold chill would have just gone right down my back at that moment. Simon, I have something to say to you. I wonder if Jesus has ever spoke to your heart and said, hey, I have something to say to you. Your attitude's out of whack. Your priorities are not aligned the way they should be. You said you love me, but this is the way you're behaving. I wonder if Jesus has ever said, I have something to say to you. I'm proud of you today. I'm proud of what you've done. I'm proud of how you've served. I'm proud of the way you are able to forgive because I've given you the power to forgive. I wonder if Jesus has ever spoke to your heart and said, I have something to say to you. But boy, we can be so busy, we can miss it. It can go right by us. We hear the echo after it strikes against the mountain sides and the sides of the hills and the sides of the valley and finally it gets back to us, but it's a little bit delayed. Simon, I have something to say to you. Two men were in debt. One owed 500 denarii and another 50. A denarii was a day's of wages for a common laborer. So one was over a year in debt 
almost two years in debt. And this one man was in debt, well, just a couple of months. But the problem was both were unable to pay. Both could have been sold into slavery. But the, Jesus said, but something marvelous happened. The man they were in debt to generously forgave both of them. And then Jesus said to Simon, Simon, which do you believe would love the master the most? And Simon thought about it for a second and he said, well, I guess the one that was forgiven the most. And Jesus said, you have judged rightly. Don't ever forget that. Jesus said it. That makes it true. For the one who has been forgiven most, that person will love the most. For the one who has been forgiven little, that person will love little. Find a person in your life, if it's you or someone you know, and you wonder, why can't that person love? Why is that person so incapable of love? I'll tell you why. In that person's heart, they have been forgiven little. Not that Jesus won't forgive, but that they won't accept it. They're unwilling, unable to accept it. Jesus said this, where much is forgiven, there is much love. Where little is forgiven, there is little love. So let me ask you again, are you in debt? How much have you been forgiven? Two songs come to my mind. One song is, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to take my debt away. Peter wrote about this in 1 Peter chapter 2, 24. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live in righteousness. For by his wounds we are healed. What was the price he paid to answer for our sins? How much did he pay? How much are we forgiven? I wonder, if you needed a kidney or a lung and someone came to you and said, I will give you my kidney or I will give you one of my lungs, how grateful would you be? Would you remember them in your will? Would you remember them with a Christmas card or maybe even a Christmas present? Would you offer to take them out to dinner? If they asked for a loan, would you freely give it to them? I'm thoroughly convinced any of us would answer, of course we would. But I want us to think for a moment, how much do we owe Jesus? How much could we pay Him for what He has done for us? The old song goes, Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but He washed it white as snow. And now before the throne, I stand in Him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips will still repeat. One time Paul wrote to a group of Christians and said, I am in debt. My debt is to the Lord, of course, but the way I discharge that debt is, is by sharing the gospel with everyone. I wonder, how much have you been forgiven? How much do you love? As we ask for a song and give an invitation this morning, I wonder, could we stand in Simon's place today as he hears the Lord say, Simon, I have something to say to you. Simon, I have something to say to you. We went to the Gideon's banquet uh, last Friday evening and heard a delightful testimony from a lady that was a stewardess for American Airlines. And 
She talked about being a, a, a very, very, very devoted sinner. She said, I was devoted to the party life. I decided to divorce my husband so I could have the party life, and I was going to go out and, and be, uh, decided to be a nurse. My, my life was empty, and it was cold, and that's all I wanted to do was, was party and, and go to places. And she said, one night I was in my motel room, and it was like a darkness darker than anything I had ever felt in my life came over me. And there was a voice urging me to end my own life. But then I noticed there was a Bible there in the room. And after I saw that Bible, it was like there was a light that came to me and a, another voice that spoke to me. And that voice called me out of that life and called me into a new life. And she said, you know, she said, I was, I was uh, of the Catholic faith then. And she said, I, I went, to, went to Mass uh, the next Sunday. And, and, the, and the priest, she said, this is a God thing. Said, has, has anyone ever had God talk to them? And she said, I raised my hand. And then I looked around and no one else had their hand raised. And I slowly put my hand back down. But she said, God had talked to me. I heard him. And I thought... Wow. Simon, I have something to say to you. Maybe God has something to say to you today, too. Maybe He's already said it. As we